Welcome back to the Actors Room, episode number three, episode title, Marlon Brando, part two. We're going to dive a little bit more into his life and more into the movies. I hope you enjoy the show. Here we go. My name is Jeff Tarowski, and welcome back once again to the Actors Room. I am looking forward to diving more into Marlon Brando. It's going to be great. Uh, We're going to talk about mostly his movies and a little bit about him. Viva Zabata was the first movie after A Streetcar Named Desire. Uh, He played a Mexican and was paid $100,000, which was a lot of money for anyone back in the 50s. Uh, He went to Sonora and researched his role. He lived among the peasants, and Elia Kazan directed the film and wanted to shoot it in Mexico. Now, Mexico wanted the film to portray it their way, which was pro-communism. If not, Mexico threatened to boycott Fox Productions and also said the Indians in Mexico were dangerous and crew's safety was not guaranteed. So just a little insight into how that uh, movie got a little bit of uh, negative feedback from the Mexican government. Uh, They pretty much said, listen, if you want to do the film here, you're going to have to live by our rules. So Gadge, which is um, Leah Kazan's nickname, decided maybe, just maybe, it would be a better idea to do it in Texas. So that's what they did. Anthony Quinn plays about his brother. Now, Zabata was Bud's first outdoor action movie. So he was looking forward to getting on the horse and just, you know, riding around and doing something fun. Uh, Bud was playing a real person, so he faced creating a characterization. Bud tried to seduce Jean Peters, his co-star. She was Howard Hughes' girlfriend. No matter. Bud went after her anyway. He threw pebbles at her window, climbed a tree outside her window, and serenaded her with his recorder. Bud met Movida Castaneda on the set of Zabata. She ended up eventually being his second wife. Bud had a scene in Zabata where he had to be drunk. He insisted that he wasn't going to play drunk. So he downed a whole bottle of vodka for the scene, being real, being drunk, doing it his way. He was so drunk that his acting was all over the place, so they had to piece it together post-editing. Bud acting alongside Anthony Quinn was a bit of an issue. Both had large egos, and Quinn had also played Stanley Kowalski in The Traveling Company, so there was a little bit of a rivalry going on there. You know, my Stanley was better, your, whatever, you know, we we all know that Marlon Stanley was better. You know, Quinn's a fine actor, but come on now. Some said they thought Quinn played Stanley better, and they're insane. Uh, Kazan wanted them to be well acquainted with one another. So he had them share a train compartment from L.A. to Texas. Now, Quinn states that Bud only packed a small bag that contained two shirts. He brought with him his pet raccoon named Russell. He fed the animal with a baby bottle, slept with Russell nestled under his arm, and whispered to him while the raccoon slept. I don't know why that's so funny. I'd be, I'd maybe just because I had a, I have a visual just then, of, <laughs> of him nestling in his arm like a baby, and you know, I don't know with the bottle and whispering to him. I, I, that's adorable and weird all at the same time, you know. And I could see how Quinn was probably creeped out by it a little bit. Um, so <laughs> Quinn says that. He stayed out of the train compartment on purpose just so he wouldn't, you know, have to be in the same room with them and be weirded out. Um, they hardly talked, and uh, and that was that. Um, there was also um, a, a big fight scene between Brando and Quinn in Viva Zabata, and Ilya Kazan really wanted to get the best out of both of them. So what he did was he took he took them aside separately. And whispered in their ear, you know, uh, <clears throat> Tony, which was Anthony Quinn. Tony, listen. Everybody knows, and especially, you know, Brando, that 
his streetcar was definitely better than yours, and you know it. And uh, I just want you to know that. And uh, Marlon told me that you don't belong on the same stage with him. He told me that. Don't want to tell you this, but I think that you may want to know that. So, you know, he's got Quinn just seething, you know. He's getting them all revved up. So he goes to uh, Bud next and, of course, does, you know, pretty much the same thing. You know, Tony Tony really thinks that he did a better Stanley, and there's no doubt about it. Uh, he even told me himself. So, uh, Bud, I just thought I'd tell you that and, uh, you know, go ahead do your scene. So now he's got Bud, and that's what Gadge did. He would, he was great at getting actors, how to push their buttons and so forth. So you have these two pissed off actors ready to do battle, and I guess the fight got got pretty real. And it took a few people to tear them apart when the scene ended. But Aliyah Kazan got what he wanted. He was very happy, got a nice fight scene, and all was well with the world. Kazan is quoted as saying. Here's a quote. Marlon always gave me more than I asked. He always gave me more than 100% of himself. End quote. The Zabato role gave Bud his second best actor nomination. The critics loved his performance. Bud, he didn't. He felt that he didn't do Zabata justice. When he looked back on the role, he felt he played him too soft. Zabata was a tougher character and he made him softy. So the acting itself was fine. I like Sabata. It's a good film. And his acting in it is very well done. But he's right. You, that's, that's the way Brando usually approached his role. And that's just a part of him. He's a sensitive guy. And he brought his sensitivity into roles. So in that sense, you know, he's right. He played him too soft. So he wasn't happy with the role. His next film both excited him and scared the shit out of him. Julius Caesar. He was going to try Shakespeare. Now, this was an opportunity to expand his range as an actor. Show them, you know, I can do it. I can surprise them. Many executives in the in- industry scoffed at the idea of mumbling Brando taking on a classic Shakespearean character like Antony. And to be quite honest with you, Marlon himself had reservations. Once again, Faced with the idea of doing Shakespeare on film, Brando confessed that this project was, quote-unquote, fucking scary. Critics in Hollywood made fun of the idea that Bud was giving this a try. He found it difficult living down the image of Stanley Kowalski. And from his point of view, critics and audiences saw him as Stanley mostly because that was a role that really put him on the map. So he wanted to show everybody that he wasn't, what he says, a slobber mouth. This gave him even more drive to prove them all wrong. Even his mother Dodie was telling him, take the part. She would say stuff like, you haven't done anything until you've done Shakespeare. Show him you can do it. As Bud walked on set from the wings to give his friends, Romans, and countrymen speech, he gave his first line, and it drowned among the hundreds of extras. The director shouted at Brando, Get mad! Then it happened. Bud's voice bellowed out his Shakespeare dialogue with gusto. The crowd hushed and listened. When all of his 34 lines were done, the entire cast and crew broke out into applause. The director said that it was the greatest moment I have ever felt as a director. It's what made my whole career worthwhile. Critics called Julius Caesar as the best Shakespeare that Hollywood has ever done. The film was a smash hit. Here's a nice quote. Hollywood knows that Brando is more than tight-lipped, beautiful, muscled Stanley Kowalski. From now on, he can announce that he is going to play King Lear or Peter Pan and nobody will laugh. Caesar gave him his third Academy Award nomination. Marlon Brando hated fame, but tried to use it to his advantage. For the most part, it, it bothered him because he couldn't walk down the street anymore and he loved his anonymity. He liked getting the money and the money was nice because he was now rich, but he said it was the price he had to pay. His next film was The Wild One. Bud felt very comfortable in this role. 
He was confident in his acting style and often helped out the other actors with preparing for scenes. He befriended real cycle gangs and got down their lingo pretty well. The famous line of, what do you got, actually came from a conversation he had with a gang member. His sister Jocelyn visited him on the set and he joked around with her laughing and carrying on and so forth, you know, being um, on the set of the movie. And the director would need him on the set, and he was there, in character and ready to go. That's a classic example of turning on the switch. Bud was disappointed in the director and soon became really frustrated with both the movie and his role in it. He felt that if the director didn't know what the hell he was doing, then fuck it. And he had that attitude a lot during his career. He felt that if the director wasn't A, talented enough, and B, didn't push him when he needed the help, that why even bother? If the director doesn't know what he's doing, then why should I even care? The movie will probably go nowhere, so what's the point? Um, Bud would also be inclined to direct himself when necessary, so I kind of see this part of it. Like When he really cared about a movie and the director sucked, he would then go ahead and direct himself. The film was banned in Memphis, Tennessee, and was also banned for 15 years in England. Bud called the movie a sin and explained that he was toying with the idea of quitting the movie business altogether. Now, I don't know. I I thought the movie was fine. Uh, It's got some cute moments, and for the time that the movie came out in the 50s, I could see what the big hoopla was with the whole... You know, the gangs and the bikes and creating havoc and so on. And then them sort of, you know, not making a point to have them be in trouble for what they did and and that sort of thing. It really did create a lot of turmoil, not within just the movie business, but also outside of it as well. As you can see, I mean, it was banned in England for 15 years. That's a long time. Um... Because of this, Brando would go on his classic, Oh, I Might Quit Acting. He, uh, he states, and, and this is a quote, I may go live on my farm instead of, you know, acting. Maybe just go back to stage work from time to time. But I got a farm, and I'll just tend to my animals. We'll see. But also began to eat more than he used to at this point. Then came On the Waterfront. I love this movie. I just watched it a couple of weeks ago. I just, one of those movies when I just want to sit back and watch a classic masterpiece. On the Waterfront is that the casting in it is perfect. Every one of those characters was perfectly cast. I love Carl Malden, and I might as well tell my Carl Malden story now. Carl Malden was not only a co star of Marlon Brando in. On the waterfront. He was also a co-star on A Streetcar Named Desire, the movie. And on stage, he played Mitch on stage as well as the film. And he shared a dressing room with Brando for a while, for a few years. So he saw a lot of them. And he said there were times when they didn't speak at all. It was just kind of weird. That's the way Bud was. But anyways, Carl Malden was a good guy. Period. And I wrote a Marlon Brando screenplay about eight years ago. And it took me about two years to write. And I was really proud of it. It's not perfect. But you know what? I thought it was pretty good. And I sent it all over the place. I sent it to every agency you can think of. Every literary agent in the country. No kidding. I sent it everywhere. Pretty much. And I also sent it to actors, directors writers, producers, anyone I can think of related to Marlon Brando. And one of those people was Carl Malden. I found his address, known that he did live there, and he had lived there for a long time. And actually, the house that he lived in at that time and bought was paid because of the money he earned on One Night Jacks, the movie that Marlon Brando wrote, directed, and starred in. Carl Malden was in it as well. We'll get into that 
probably in the next podcast. But I did send a letter to Carl Malden, and would you believe it? A month later, I received a phone call. Now, I was not there to get that phone call, but he left me a message. For some reason, the number I put down to reach me, now this was before cell phones, that I had a cell phone anyway, so this was eight years ago, I didn't have a cell phone at that time, so I left my work number, and I leave work at 5.30, and he called at 5.45. If I would have had a little bit of overtime that day, or I was kind of busy, I would have got that phone call. But he left me a message, a sweet little, it had to have been a couple minute message, just saying, you know, I appreciate the letter. I am interested to talk to you more about what you sent me, because I actually sent him probably, I would say maybe 20 pages of the script. I didn't send him the whole thing. I just sent him a few pages, a little taste, and I wanted his opinion on it. And he called me back. Carl Malden, right? So, like I said, left a sweet little message. Said, Hi, this is Carl. It was him. There was no doubt about it. The guy had a, you know, you just, you, I knew it was him. He sounded old. It was Carl Malden. It was definitely him. And he said he was going to call me back. And he never did. I wait. That was, I was so excited. I, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, Carl Malden called me. This, this is great. I can't wait to talk to him because I am going to chew his ear, ear off. I am going to ask him every freaking question I can think of because I was in full-blown Marlon Brando screenwriting mode. I mean, I was writing a script about his life. So I was researching everywhere and getting opinions. And, oh, I just couldn't wait to talk to him about everything that he experienced with Brando and his own career and everything like that. And and if for some unspeakable way he had, uh, you know, some kind of inside information about how I could actually, you know, get this into the right hands or if he was the right person to, I mean, he was president of, of the American Academy of Motion Pictures, you know, the Oscars for years. So the guy knew people. He was one of Brando's dearest friends up until a certain point. But he never called me back and it was... I was so excited for about a month. And then after a month, realizing that, ah, oh, man. Because, of course, he didn't leave his number. Because, believe me, if he left his number, guess who would have called him? This guy. But he didn't. He didn't know who I was. He said he was going to call back. And he ended up passing within the year. So, okay, that was my Carl Malden story. And that screenplay I wrote about Brando took me two years to write and the idea was to break it into two sections because I had a lot of information and my pages were stacking up and like this is either going to be one long movie or I could split it into two so I decided to split it into two Uh, the first part was going to be called the first movie was going to be called Marlin and then the second one Brando I thought brilliant right it just makes sense There's a lot to cover. Why try to squeeze everything into one movie like I'm doing with the podcast? I really didn't want to squeeze it all condensed into just one podcast. There's a lot to talk about. So I thought, you know, take my time. Doing a couple. So that's what I did with the movie. First part, Marlon. Second part, Brando. So that was my idea. And boy, I didn't get much response. But what happened was I did make some contacts with actresses and actors and a few of them were very interested and they went the extra mile to gain interest from their friends who were directors writers producers so I met a lot of people just getting to know people through networking and networking is key people you're thinking about getting into the business networking is something you have to do and if you can't network good luck Um, I got close I I actually got an agent with William Morse, and he got it up to the Brando estate at one point, and they said, no way, it's never going to happen, sorry, get it out of your mind. So that was a crushing, you know, I worked hard on that, did a lot of networking, but, you know, that's just what happens, that's that's reality. Uh, Marlon Brando does not want anything 
no movie done about him. It's never going to happen. I think it would be so wonderful to see a movie about him. But unfortunately, the Brando estate is not going to let it happen. No matter how much money they would make on it, Marlon Brando never wanted to have a movie done about him. So there you go. Okay, back to Waterfront. Um, Most critics will say this was the greatest performance of his career. For me, it's Streetcar. That's just me, though. Streetcar took the cake. He changed acting with that film. That character was awesome. He was awesome in it. It just, for, for me, Streetcar's performance, the movie, I think, Waterfront is better than Streetcar Named Desire, but Marlon Brando was better in Streetcar Named Desire than On the Waterfront. And now, I know, it's give or take. It, I mean, it, it's tough to compare the two. But if I were to pick, mine would be Streetcar. Um, you know, he changed everything with that performance. A new way of acting, a breath of fresh air for future generations of actors and actresses. I don't need to say anymore, right? <laughs> you know my opinion. All right. Um, it was Kazan's baby, and the film almost didn't get made. All the big studios rejected it, stated that nobody wanted to watch a bunch of sweaty longshoremen. Who's going to give a shit, right? So thankfully, greater heads prevailed, and the production began with Brando at the lead. He would play the character of Terry Malloy, a true underdog story. Him against the world, the underworld, of New York City. Brando's acting prowess was in full effect. He used his improv skills to perfection. And a great example of this is the glove scene. If you're not familiar with Waterfront, you may not know what I'm talking about. But if you are, you know what I'm talking about. The scene where he's talking to um, Eva Marie Saint's character. She drops her glove, this white glove. And as they're walking in the park... He picks it up for her and she looks at him and is waiting for him to give it back to her. And the the scene is still going on, of course. Kazan does not cut it. He's going to see where it goes. So Marlon takes the glove, keeps it, and actually, at one point, puts the glove on. And it's such a sweet moment. Like You could tell just by the way he, he acts. That when I say he uses everything and he's natural, that's a perfect example. She drops her glove on accident in the scene. He picks it up and he sort of plays around with it instead of just doing the, you know, normal, you know, here's your glove. He holds on to it. He plays with it, puts it on this tight, you know, this, this tight little white glove that's made for a girl. Like he's putting it on his big hands and you can tell like it barely fits on his hand. So it's kind of like a cute little moment. Then he takes it off and starts, you know, he's kind of playing with the fingertips and you can watch him doing it. He's just sort of playing around with the fingertips. It's just this beautiful improv, very natural. And then when you're doing that sort of thing, the dialogue just sort of flows out and it's so real and it's a great little moment. So if you ever watch on the waterfront again and you didn't know that cute little moment, it's one to look out for and really take notice. Uh, The filming of the movie was done in Manhattan, of course, and in the middle of the coldest winter in modern history. Brando stated that it was so cold that it was nearly impossible to overact. Bud's research was at its peak once again. He connected with a future co-star in The Godfather. Uh, There was a a character named Salazzo, I'm sure you remember Salazzo. Um, he approached uh, the Godfather character in order to get his okay to sell drugs. That's Salazzo. Well, his real name is Al Lettery. And uh, he was friends with Brando. And he got a lot of advice doing this movie, doing On the Waterfront, from Al. And Al was actually a heroin addict. And, you know, the real thing, Brando would say. And his could have been a contender scene was a direct correlation with his time spent with Al. Um, Bud's performance worked because the character called for both a feminine and a tough side. Bud played both of these together brilliantly. Uh, The famous taxi cab scene was chaotic. Uh, The producer was too cheap to provide a real taxi cab, so they used a shell of a taxi cab, and they had, like, extras with sticks pushing on the cab, like it was, you know, hitting bumps and things like that, and, and the 
back window was open, so they didn't know what to do. I mean, you can't be looking out and seeing the back of a studio. So one of the uh, the crew members said, listen, I just uh, was in a cab today, and uh, the back window was covered in a Venetian blind. Why don't we just do that? So Gadget's like, get me a Venetian blind. So they got a Venetian blind, put it in the back. So that took care of that problem. And so they just sort of worked around it. And they had to be sure to get the scene in on time because Brando had it in his contract that he would not work past 5 o'clock. It was vital that he would go to his psychoanalysis. This was important to him. He was in therapy and felt that he had to go every day and no matter where he was in the shot or the scene, if it was 5 o'clock, we stopped, it was over, I have to go to my therapy session. So they were working up against that. So they tried to get as much as possible um, because Rod Steiger was, you know, his co-star in the taxi cab. And so they would do all of Brando's close-ups and things like that first. So if they needed to, and they ran out of time, and Brando would be gone, then they would do uh, Rod Steiger's uh, close-ups and lines if need be. So they were, were, you know, Gadge had a lot of... (laughs) issues going on here. Uh, you had Brando's, uh, you know, problems, you know, not only was he hard to work with, um, on set, but he had to deal with all of his issues offset. And then, you know, you had to pay him special attention because he was the star. He was the most talented. So you had to sort of, you know, baby him and, you know, touch him with kid gloves, so to speak. And then you had his co-star seeing this, seeing this, favoritism and things like that and and then it would upset people like Steiger like you know why are you always pampering Brando you know I'm here too and you know you have this this guy going off to psychoanalysis in the middle of a very important scene and I'm stuck here you know with my with my dick in the wind so what happened was Brando and Steiger did the scene and it took about seven or eight times to get it just right and it is said to be one of the greatest scenes in cinema history, I don't. I, I love the scene. Don't get me wrong. I love the scene. It's a great scene, and I don't. It's hard to say that it's the greatest scene in cinema history, but I will say this: Marlon Brando gives the best moment maybe in cinema history when he's confronted by his brother with a gun to him. His brother's trying to tell him, "Listen, you have to do this. You are going to do this. I have a gun in your face. I will kill you." If you don't do what I say. So Brando's choice as an actor was to gently, uh, you know, brush the gun away instead of doing the classic, what are you doing to me, brother? How dare you? You're going to kill me? You know, fuck you. How dare you? And like, you know, maybe jump out of the car. Uh, No, What, what Brando does is something more beautiful and subtle and sensitive. He just gently pushes the gun away, right? And he's like, wow, really? I mean, my brother is putting a gun in my face. I can't believe this. This is insane. Wow, Charlie. You know, thanks. Thanks for putting a gun in my face. So, you know, maybe it's the the greatest choice by an actor in, in film. Could be. And the scene was really well done. And, you know, Gadge saying it was one of the greatest scenes he's ever had to direct and and Steiger will go on to say that working with Brando yet difficult paid off there's no doubt about it the guy is a genius the choices he makes you know it it completely froze him in that moment he didn't know Rod Steiger didn't know what to do he was expecting that classic reaction of you know arguing and you know there's going to be an argument about it but that didn't happen Brando showed another side a sensitive side that Wow. And then Steiger's character reacting off of Bud was to totally collapse within himself and realize that he really is a piece of shit. (laughs) You know, Brando made him realize that, you know what, brother, you're a piece of shit. Thanks a lot. Wow. You were going to kill me over some money. Real nice. That performance was free of false notes. Kazan was quoted as saying, The finest thing ever done by an American screen actor was that scene. Brando's co-star, Carl Malden, called it genius. Bud would confide in his sister Jocelyn that it was getting harder and harder to use all of himself to erect the emotions of the character. 
The well was drying up, and it worried him. He was scraping the bottle of the barrel. With all the success as an actor, this was the worst Bud had been psychologically. He was deep in analysis and had trouble sleeping. He could be seen downtown walking the cold city streets in the middle of the night, or playing his drums into the early mornings. He was silent and distraught. With the picture completed, the screening took place with Bud in attendance. Bud asked Carl Maldwin how he felt about it. You know, what do you think of the picture? And Maldwin said it was a good picture. But what did Bud think? Eh, in and out, in and out. That was something he would say in the old days. Uh, back in New York, while Carl Maldwin and Brando were doing streetcar to- together, it meant that he was in and out of the character. In and out, in and out. If you watch real closely, you can see Bud disengaging at times with this character. That's where he got the reference, in and out. Um, He would be so focused and really in the scene most of the time. But once in a while, he would sort of just slip away. It happens, and it just displeased him to see that performance and actually watch himself do it. So that's what he means by in and out, in and out. I guess it's really tough to be great, right? <laughs> the, the film was called a masterpiece, and Brando gave the performance of the year. Waterfront was nominated for 12 Oscars, and Bud won his first Oscar. On the Waterfront brought it to him, and he really wanted it. He actually campaigned for it. I mean, he was actually nervous. He was there at the Academy Awards, and people say that he was visibly nervous, uh, biting his fingernails and so on. He had this gum that he was gnashing on the whole night. So when Betty Davis went up to the podium to announce Best Actor for a Motion Picture, when she said, Marlon Brando, He nervously got up real quick, jumped out of his seat. And you can actually watch his acceptance speech on YouTube. It's really quick. It's not like the speeches they give today. I mean, the speeches they give today are absolutely ridiculous. And I used to love watching the Oscars when I was a kid and all the way up to even past acting school when I moved back home. I would still really love to watch it, but I got to tell you, the past couple of years, I would say the past three Oscars, I haven't watched one minute, not one. I just can't do it anymore. I don't know if it's just I had my fill of the Oscars or, you know, it's that, you know what it is too, that uh, that red carpet shit. I don't know what it is about that red carpet BS where they're asking them where they got their dress and blah, blah, blah. It's so fake. It's just, I mean, I know, I understand that it's part of the show. It's just, for some reason, it just, it turns me off. And even, even back when I enjoyed watching the Oscars, that part of it always just rubbed me the wrong way. It just does. So maybe that's part of it. And the other part, I don't know, maybe it just... It's just the same old thing. Um, it, I don't know. It, the, the best part is at the end when you see who wins best picture and best actor and things like that. But by then, I'm, I'm in bed. I mean, by the time they're announcing that, it's close to midnight. And I'm just done. It's like on a Sunday night too, man. I got to work the next day. So there's my little speech about the Oscars. But, you know, back then... Brando gets up there, and you can see he's visibly nervous, excited, happy. You know, he was thrilled to get that award. He worked really hard for it. When they're telling you you're one of the best actors of that time, you deserve that. So he was proud to have it, and he says something like, it's a little heavier than I thought, and thank you, it's a great honor, I'm happy, and then he left. It was like a total of a 15-second speech, not like today, and then... Of course, when he won for The Godfather, we all pretty much know what happened there. And we're going to get into that in the next episode. Not too much into it. I don't really want to get into the the political stuff about Brando. I know that was a big part of his life. Um, I'm not really going to touch on that too much. I will just, uh, you know, lightly graze the the, uh, acceptance speech 
given by Sashin Littlefeather for The Godfather. But we're not going to get into the, the politics. It's just, it's not my bag. And we're also not going to talk about his kids. And that's another thing I don't want to do either. I'm, I'm strictly wanting to talk about his career, um, his childhood, which molded him. You know, that stuff's important when talking about Marlon Brando. So I just kind of wanted to put that out there. Like I said, he was happy to get the Oscar and he was even joking around afterwards with Grace Kelly. She had won Best Actress that year. And they gave some publicity shots together, giving each other kisses and things like that. And there was an after party that Bud went to with his friends and co-workers. And he enjoyed himself. He had a, a nice evening. He had his dad with him that night as well. Um, his mother, Dodie, had passed away about a year before then. And she really, really wanted to see him get that Oscar. So, you know, there was part of Dodie with him that night as well. So it was a very special evening, a great night, a a historic night. Not only for Marlon Brando, but for the acting world. It was just a very good night. James Dean was on the lot next to Bud's on his next picture. Dean was filming East of Eden at the time with Aaliyah Kazan. And talk was, he was the next big thing. I think Brando was threatened by him. I I do. It was just because Dean looked up to Bud and mimicked him many of his techniques and other things that he did in his life. You know, Bud paved the way for actors like Dean. And Dean really did look up to him. And in Peter Manso's book, he paints a picture of the two of them not getting along. But I wouldn't say they were friends. I'm not saying that. I think that they were acquaintances. I think they they got along just fine. I mean, they ran into each other a lot on set. So, although they never did work together, they would see each other around. And because Dean was coming up and becoming a bigger star, you know, there would be publicity shots. And there was a time when, when Marlon Brando went and visited the set of East of Eden. And took shots, took pictures. And you can see those pictures of, uh, I think, Julie Harris is there with Aaliyah Kazan, Bud, and Dean. And, you know, look like nice pictures, them all getting along. Um, Bud saw him, I think, as a little bit of a threat just because he was getting attention. I mean, here's James Dean, this kid that acts like me. And he's doing a picture with my director, you know, Aaliyah Kazan. you got to see it from... Marlon's standpoint, like, who is this little shit? (laughs) Acting like me, wanting to be like me, working with my director. So you can kind of see why he didn't think the the best of James Dean. But nonetheless, they got along for the most part. And they would go to parties and you would see Marlon Brando at a party and James Dean would come in and he would just want to go up to talk to Marlon because he's just as intimidated by Marlon Brando as anybody would be. You know, when you're the, the top of your game and you're just starting up like Dean was, he was just scared to talk to Marlon Brando. So he would mope around at parties because Bud wasn't talking to him. Bud didn't want to talk to him. Uh, Bud said that James Dean would call him up, leave messages, and Bud would never call him back. It was just one of those things. Dean was just another actor trying to make his way. Bud was aware of him, but not only that, he was kind of worried about him. Uh, And at one party, he gave him his analyst number and said, Look, kid, you might want to look this guy up, talk to somebody. Guys and Dolls was a project Bud was hesitant to do because he didn't sing. And I could tell that. You know, he tried, but he just doesn't have... A singing voice. I mean, not everybody can sing. But they worked with him. And they got a decent performance out of him, I think. You know, for someone that can't sing, it's, you know, he did a fine job. And Guys and Dolls was a fun picture to watch. Um, I enjoyed it. Uh, it. It was great to see Frank Sinatra and Brando on the same screen. Um, Guys and Dolls in itself is just a fun project. Um, I wish I would have done it on stage. I did West Side Story, 
which was great. It's one of my favorites. Um, Guys and Dolls is one that I always wanted to do as well. I just love the music in it. I think it's really great. The Cheesecake Story. Okay. I think I mentioned before how Frank Sinatra had a bit of a grudge. He didn't get the on the waterfront part. He thought he had it in a bag. And he knew that if he did get that part, chances are he would have been at least nominated for an Academy Award. And look, you know, Marlon, that that role gave him an Academy Award. So he was just, uh, he was pissed he didn't get that role. And he held it against Brando. So on the filming of Guys and Dolls, they didn't get along at all. They would just not talk, communicate, unless they had to. And the cheesecake story. Okay, here it goes. Because they didn't get along, Bud wanted to have a little fun. So if you remember in Guys and Dolls, Brando and Sinatra are sitting down in the restaurant and and Frank is eating cheesecake while Bud is just sitting there watching him. So the story is that Bud kept giving his lines wrong on purpose. Flubbing them so he'd have to keep on doing take after take. So Frank would have to keep on eating the cheesecake because that's what his character is doing in that scene. Eating cheesecake. So every time Bud made a mistake, they'd have to restart. Keep eating cheesecake, so to speak. So I don't know if Frank was catching on to the fact that Bud was doing it on purpose, but no matter... Frank had to keep stuff in his face with his cheesecake, right? So after the seventh, eighth take, Frank had enough, stood up, said, if you keep fucking up, I'm going to take this cheesecake and shove it in your face. So eventually, Bud, you know, laughed it off. It was more serious for Frank because, you know, he was more of a tight ass, I think. No, don't, I, I mean, I never knew him, of course. So um, I'm just, what I read what I heard, uh, and Bud saw it more as just, who gives a shit, you know, I'm just fucking around. Frank doesn't like me, who cares? You know, I got a lot of friends, no big deal. He was just doing one of his little pranks, having a good time. Uh, Guys and Dolls, the success of it, laid mostly upon the fact that everybody wanted to see Marlon Brando sing. They wanted to see him sing and dance. So, hey, if he could do Shakespeare, he can do anything, right? Uh, the Guys and Dolls premiere was a spectacle. Uh, everybody wanted a piece of Brando. Barricades caved in, and Bud was soon surrounded by fans just crashing all around him. Uh, he would later say he was so scared that he thought the crowd was going to trample him. And he also stated that it was like he was in a submarine. Very scary moment. In 1955, Brando was named Hollywood's top money-making star. Tea House of the August Moon was his next film, and he took he took it with great enthusiasm. Um, I have to admit that I'm not very familiar with this film. I think I've only seen it one time, and it was a while ago. Um, but I, I wasn't that impressed with it. I didn't really think it was that funny. Uh, maybe a few moments here and there. Uh, Brando, I, I know I could see what he wanted to do with that role. You could tell that he actually did care. I just didn't get it. I, I think that actors should kind of know their limitations. And Brando did have some limitations. Everybody does. There are certain things that you can't do. Okay? You can try as hard as you can. But if it's not for you, it's called being miscast or just thinking you could do something you can't. The movie, eh, you know, it's hard to find too. It's not a very popular movie. So I don't know too much about it. But here's a little insight into Bud's odd behavior. The director of August Moon, Daniel Mann, went to a party that Bud was at. Okay? Now, during the party, there was a scream so loud and blood-curdling coming from the bathroom that Mann said it sounded like a man getting his balls cut off. Everyone rushed to see what was going on. And Bud was just standing there with a smirk on his face, just standing in the bathroom, looking at them with this stupid smirk, right? And he explained to them, I just, I had an impulse. 
And they're like, what are you talking about? You had an impulse. What, what does that mean? He said that, uh, you know, he just wanted to feel what it was like if somebody wanted to kill him and he was about to die. Now you have to, that might be true. Maybe. But I think Bud just wanted to get a reaction from all the people gaining attention. He was that kind of guy. He was at the party maybe and wasn't getting the attention that he wanted. Now, I'm just speculating. But someone who does this, it's like a little kid does this. You know, a little kid would pull this act. And he was good at it. Like, I'm sure that scream was just crazy insane. Like, screeching scream. I, like, ridiculous. Like, it probably sounded like a woman or something like that. But, you know, there's a little insight on what Bud would do on his time off. <laughs> yeah. Pulling pranks. Um, doing impulse things that are just off the wall, crazy, insane, and just making people think, wow, what is up with this guy? What a, what an oddball. And yeah, he was. Um, there was lots of tension on the set, and Brando and Gled Ford did not get along at all. Another actor on a film he doesn't get along with. Hmm, interesting. Um, comedy timing was off, and it was. Like, you know, like I said, I watched it a while ago, but I remember it was just off in some way. Just the comedy timing was just not there between the two of them. I mean, even if you don't get along, sometimes that doesn't matter. You know, if you work good together, it doesn't mean you have to get along off camera as well. I mean, it doesn't mean anything. If there's good chemistry between two talented people, it'll work. But for some reason, him and Glenn Ford just didn't, you know, mesh very well. Bud loved living in Japan while shooting this film, and he talked about it a lot. Um, after the success of his film career, Bud started a production company called Pennebaker. And uh, Pennebaker, if you remember, is his mother's maiden name. So he used the, the name Pennebaker for his production company. Um, Marlon Sr. worked there. Bud hired him. So funny. Dad had to be, hey, Dad, uh, would you mind uh, working with my production company? I mean, he was becoming such a big star. He had his own company, and he had his dad work for him. I'm sure he loved that. Oh, I'm sure that he was just eating that up. Bud was now Marlon Sr.'s boss. Can you imagine that? Before he got big with acting, how bad it was between the two of them, and now he's his boss. Delightful. He delighted in the fact that he was his father's boss. Brilliant. He met his first wife, Anna Kafshi, around this time. And I just struggle with saying her name every time. I don't know what it is. I think it's Kafshi. Ka? It's spelled, okay, here we go. It's spelled, maybe you can help me out. K-A-S-H-F-I. Kafshi. Okay, and maybe if you say it slow enough, it works better. Cash fee. I'll have to practice that. Cash fee. All right. So he met Anna Cash. See? I'm just not going to say it. I'm just going to say Anna. Okay, there we go. He was smitten with her. Uh, she fell ill at one point. I think it was tuberculosis. And she was in the hospital for months. And uh, Bud took great pleasure in taking care of her. He was there all the time. And... He just really loved going into the hospital and giving her what she needed, giving her the attention that she needed, and they fell in love with each other at this point. Anna reminded Bud of his mother. Sayonara is a film he enjoyed, uh, and I enjoyed watching as well. Um, for some reason, it's just one of those movies that I just think his acting in it was really free-flowing. He had a lot of really nice moments in that film. And you could tell Bud was play acting a lot. Uh, not caring too much, but playing nonetheless. Um, I like that kind of acting. I don't know. I was always struck by something my acting teacher at the Playhouse said. And he said, they call it a play because that's what it is. You should be playing, having fun. Play, play, play. Have fun if it helps you. So sometimes it does. Just playing, playing it real cool and having a good time with it. And you'll find that it is like playing. 
Although Bud would say he pretty much directed himself on this picture, I love it nonetheless. The Truman Capote story. Oh, Truman Capote, if you don't know, and I'm sure you do, was a very famous writer back then. And he had it in for Brando. He had it in for actors, basically. He saw actors as mental midgets. The two talked all night, swapping their stories. Now he trapped Brando. This is the key ingredient in making a good interviewer is the fact that you make the interviewed person make it feel like they're interviewing you. You switch tables on them. And exactly what Truman Capote did that night was he brought in a bottle of vodka. He set up the whole appointment. And he just wanted to seem like he was hanging out, swapping stories about how fucked up their lives were. Well, Bud let his guard down and told him a lot of personal, intimate things. Now, I don't know how many of them are true, but I think most were. And he talked freely. And when the conversation was going on, Bud was under the impression that it was off the record. But oh no, not with Truman Capote. You got to be careful, brother. And Truman Capote ended the evening, went home, sat himself down in front of the typewriter, and wrote himself a little article. You can go online and read it. It's called Duke of My Domain. And it's pretty extensive research done, it seemed, in other areas of Bud's life. Uh, He touches on a lot of different things. But, I mean, the article itself isn't too bad. But you get to hear the things that he says about his friends, directors, his parents. Some very personal things. So, uh... You got to be careful talking to writers and things like that, reporters. You know, they don't, uh, they don't pull any punches when it comes to, you know, ratings and getting, you know, good stories out there. I mean, that's what they live for. They live for that juicy stuff. So Brando let his guard down and Truman Capote wrote himself a nice little intimate article about Marlon Brando and he was pissed. He threatened at one point to sue him. But it never happened. He just kind of brushed it under the rug, bit his lip, and swore he would never, ever do that again. Next film for Bud was The Young Lions. He would be acting with Monty Clift. Now, him and Monty had mutual respect for one another. Monty was well-established at this point, and Bud looked up to him. One of the very few actors that Bud respected, looked up to, and said that you can learn from people like Monty Clift. Uh, They even chummed around together from time to time, goofing off, doing like little improv stuff, uh, things like that, just, you know, bumming around. They were actually, I think I would actually call Monty Clift and Marlon Brando friends. So I believe he enjoyed acting alongside Monty Clift. Bud was very uncertain if he should marry Anna Kafi. Not bad. That wasn't bad. I didn't... Say Kathy. I don't know. Kafshi. It still doesn't make sense to me. All right, we're moving on. He felt it was time to make the plunge. Get married. Maybe have a kid. You know, try the family thing. But a man like Brando cannot be tied down, right? I mean, what was he thinking? Getting married. They will eventually marry, and it was a disaster. They had a son together, Christian. And I'm not going to get into kids, as I said before. The Young Lions would wrap up a string of successful films for Bud and will wrap up this episode. All right? So the third and final segment of Marlon Brando is coming next, and we will discuss his lone directing venture in one Eye Jacks, then his performances in The Godfather, Last Tango in Paris, Apocalypse Now, and the rest of his career. Lots more to cover, but it'll be fun, you know? We're going to take the last segment, and we're going to wrap up Marlon Brando talking about some really great films he did. It'll be great to dive into those again, get some more insight on it, wrap it up like a gift the next episode. And then we're going to move on, and we're going to talk about another actor I haven't decided yet. I'm not sure what to do. I'm either going to do Dean... 
Oh, Dean, for sure, will be coming soon. But I was really thinking about maybe doing Daniel Day-Lewis. I love Daniel Day-Lewis. So, Dean or Lewis? We'll see. So, once again, thanks for listening. This just keeps getting a little easier and a little easier every time I do it. I'm trying to slow down when I talk. I try catching myself going, you're talking too fast, as I'm probably doing right now. It may not seem like it to me, but when I listen to it later on when I'm doing the editing, it seems like I'm talking too fast. So I'm going to try to do better with that, talk a little slower, take my time, let the point come to me. We'll see. Okay, thanks for listening. Put in a movie tonight. You know, I'm actually going out to a baseball game tonight. But that doesn't mean I won't put in a movie too when I come back. I should be back around 11. It's enough time before I go to bed late. It might be enough time to squeeze in a movie. I don't know. I've been wanting to watch The Usual Suspects. I haven't seen that like in about a year or two. I've been itching to watch that one. So maybe I'll watch that one tonight. Well, I hope that you put in a good movie tonight. And if not, do what you love. Thanks a lot, guys. You have a good one.